you arrived. Okay. So okay, let's go. Are you ready? Yeah. Welcome to this HRCI event, The Higher Standard, Advancing the Conversation Around Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Summit. Let's get started. My name is Alicia Corton, and I'd like to welcome you to the Uncovering Unconscious Bias Workshop. Lauren Epstein has been a recruiting and HR professional since 1996, and he is currently enrolled in the Organizational Development and Knowledge Management Master's Program at George Mason University. Lauren's book, You're Hired, Interview Skills to Get the Job Done, has been downloaded over a half million times worldwide. He hosts a weekly radio show where national experts share their insights about the workplace. Lauren's been developing and leading experiential workshops since 1993. He's SHRM SCP certified and a lifetime charter member of the Association of Talent Acquisition Professionals. Let's bring on our unconscious bias trainer, Lauren Epstein. Thanks, Alicia, and welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks, HRCI, for having me here. Uh, this is, of course, a uh, pre recorded video, and we do have a, a bunch of information on unconscious bias that we'll be sharing and one of our exercises. So later on in this 30 minute segment, there'll be an opportunity for you to participate in one of the exercises. So today, what we're gonna do is talk a bit about unconscious bias, where it come from, comes from, a little bit of the brain science, and what the impacts can be. And before we let you go, we'll give you a couple of tools on what you can do to mitigate it. Uh, this is a, a truncated version of the hour and a half workshop. So we, uh, we have cut some things out and compressed it. So uh, before we get started, just wanna let everyone know to uh, enjoy yourselves. And, uh, and if you have questions, just stop me and uh, ask. So uh, we want to find out, well, what is unconscious bias? Well, I'm going to cut this part out. So what's experiential learning? So this workshop is an experiential learning exercise where you get to uncover and learn and speak about your own biases. Uh, this is an opportunity for you to experiment and learn on your own and your learning is a function of your effort. So what's unconscious bias? Well, unconscious is when you're not aware something is occurring. So it's happening, but you're just not aware of it. And a bias is a particular tendency or an inclination to, to like something or want to do something or avoid something. Uh, the word bias is an old English word. It was uh, developed because they had built a little, a little bowling ball that had a, a bit of a weight in it that would turn it one way or the other. So that bias is just an inclination of doing something. And it's a phenomena, unconscious bias, our unconscious bias, which is a human function that we all have because we all have human brains, occurs when you form opinions about something that's occurring in your present moment, something right now, based on your past. Your brain goes to your past, finds something, and says, this looks like that, and, and says, okay, this must be like that. And it's designed to keep you safe. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. Everyone, every human being has unconscious bias. So where does it come from? Well, our unconscious bias comes from media, for example. Lots of places, but media. So television, radio, newspapers. Also from your family, where you were brought up. I was born in Brooklyn in the 60s, and I have biases just from being born in Brooklyn in that particular time frame. So what influences your biases? Uh, you, if you want, you can type your, uh, your answers in the chat. This is your first opportunity to, uh, to experience this, or if you're just watching, just write them down. Yeah, we've got some great answers. That's all, all good stuff. Family, friends, religion, all these things influence our bias. So what's the impact of unconscious bias? Well, we all think it's a bad thing. And in some ways it can be, it can have a huge detrimental effect to our work world and our personal lives. So a couple of examples, a study was done recently uh, on medical school students. So medical school students who were admitted to medical school got in based on the weather of the day of their in-person interview. So a student would go to the school to have their in-person interview and they got in or didn't get in based on the weather. They studied thousands of admission records. And when it was a cloudy day or a snowy day or a rainy day, 
fewer students got in, and when it was a sunny day, you were more likely to get in. That is an unconscious bias. Not something that people who were doing the interviewing intended, but the impact of the weather uh, was there and it showed up in this result. Another one, which is a little more interesting because it has a great outcome, is that fouls called on professional basketball players were biased based on the color of their skin. So a group of scientists, social scientists, did a study and they noticed that fouls called on, uh, on uh, black players by white referees were more than the normal and fouls called on white players by black referees were also more, not as much, but also more. And so there was a bias. And when they released the report, the NBA you know, was very uh, concerned. And, uh, but what was interesting was that three years later, the same group of social scientists did this study again, and they found that the bias had basically gone away. And the NBA didn't do a whole lot. But what happened was that by uncovering this unconscious bias for the refs, they just, hey, they don't want to be unfair. And they took actions on their own, just being aware to mitigate this bias. So that's a, a great example of how we can see it. And then by seeing it, calling it out, it will, uh, it will evaporate because people have good intention. So why is unconscious bias a problem? Well, there's some really great reasons. One is that it, risks, uh, it increases your risk to EEO claims. Uh, you don't want that kind of liability in your workplace, so you really should attend to it. Uh, also, it inhibits us from seeing what's actually happening in the present moment. Something could be happening right now in front of you, and you're making a business decision, but because of unconscious bias, you're using a past reference and not making the best decision. And we've all seen this happen. And it creates dysfunction in the workplace. We want to have healthy workplaces where people get along, we're productive, and effective, and we have engagement and retention, and unconscious bias does not support that. And there's some great business cases. I know many of you are HR professionals, and you're, uh, you're thinking about how can I get my leadership to buy onto this, buy into this, excuse me. And so I'll give you some, some citations. Harvard Business Review did a study on how diversity can drive innovation. Great, great thing to read. Also McKinsey and Company, uh, they did this Why Diversity Matters report twice. Uh, excellent. Uh, and both of these studies point to the fact that organizations that have less unconscious bias have more diversity, and organizations that have more diversity are more effective and more profitable. And these are really good, uh, good reasons to do it from a business case. For me, it's because I believe it's the moral and ethical thing to do to make sure that our workplaces are, are just for everyone. So where does your, where does the, where in your brain does bias originate? So in your brain, you have what are called amygdala and there are two, uh, amygdala means almond and they're kind of here in your brain. One's a little bit bigger than the other and they are bundles of neurons. And these neurons uh, are always scanning. They're always on. And the reason they're always on is because as, as humans, when we were first, you know, came to the, came to the earth, our primary function 200,000 years ago was to stay alive, was to survive. And so all of these functions around survival occur around the, the parts of our brain that are called the, the reptilian or the kind of your, your prime brain. Your, uh, your amygdala does this processing really, really fast, super fast. So when is your amygdala activated? Well, when it finds a match, see it's always on, it's always looking. But when it finds a match between an experience that we're having now and a memory from our past, it, it gets activated and it takes action. It goes back and says, oh, um, that person that I saw with a, with a dark red shirt and they punched me and I see someone now with a dark red shirt, I may make that connection, right? That's a danger. And it's usually around things that keep us, that, that, that we believe, we perceive to be dangerous, either physically dangerous or emotionally dangerous or psychologically dangerous. And those, those reactions come right to the fore. Also, when you don't have enough time or you don't have enough information to make the right choices, your amygdala will take over and you'll make a quick snap decision. That's another way to feel that you're not really safe. And again, with snap decisions in life, and I'll show you a couple examples, and I'm sure you've had this experience. 
I'm sure many of you have been driving on the road and all of a sudden, without even thinking about it, you move the car quickly to the right or left within milliseconds. And it's usually a couple of milliseconds, 20 milliseconds or something like that, where you don't have to think about it, but your, your brain processed something. There was something dangerous over here on your right or your left and you move the car. And that's great. Thank you, Amygdala, for keeping us alive. It's a great, it's a great, great uh, uh, part of our brain that helps us out. And then we have slow thinking. We want to be able to kind of think about things in a more contemplative way. And that uses our prefrontal cortex, which is the front of our brain. And both of those two things, parts of our brains are actually engaged, but not at the same time. So we can get, we can get our prefrontal cortex, our slow thinking part activated with some of the tools that I'm going to show you in a second, some of the techniques. But when we're in that amygdala state, we really have no control. But there is a way to shift. And I'm going to show you an example of that later. So either way, fast or slow thinking are great, depending on the moment. So now we're going to do the exercise. Oh, and before we go on, any questions from the audience? So what you're going to do, audience that are uh, in our in-studio our in audience, and those of you who are watching this, is that you are going to read what comes up and you are going to do it, say it out loud and fast. So you'll see it and you can just follow along with, uh, with the group here. So uh, we're gonna start this in three, two, one. M-I-L-K, 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 M-I-L-K. So cows drink water. <laughs> so what, what happened there, right? So what I did was I hijacked your brain. Yeah. So you all just experienced what's called priming bias. There are 170 different kinds of biases that you could label. And the one that we're just talking about here is priming. So I primed you. Like when you watch a, uh, a commercial for food and you get hungry, that's priming. And it's a memory effect. And it occurs when your exposure to one stimulus influences the response to another. And it happens all the time. But it's important to see that it happens because this is a brain function. So a lot of people will say that person has unconscious bias and they'll make somebody wrong or they'll blame somebody for having unconscious bias. But we all have unconscious bias. And this priming is a form of unconscious bias. You were not aware of what was going on but it occurred anyway. And it's important for us to see as HR professionals that we need to create a language around unconscious bias. So one, let's take the stigma away and take that, that so that we can talk about it, right? The only way we're gonna get through this is to talk about it. You can use priming and specifically to train a person's memory and you can train it in a negative and positive way. We, we would like you to do it in, in a positive way. And again, this occurs even if you're not aware. So all of this unconscious bias, you're not aware of this. This all occurred. I've had people do this exercise multiple times and still say milk. So we're gonna talk about reducing bias in four areas. There are four main areas that, that our workshops deal with. One is recruiting, who you're bringing in. And we talk about things such as scorecards, which allow you to ask specific questions and have your interviewers give an, a score, a one to five score. And this helps mitigate bias. Also experiential interviewing, when you have your, uh, your, your interviewees, your interviewees do the tasks that they're supposed to be doing and demonstrate their ability. Also, we can talk about talent pools and where are you getting people? Are you finding people? Are you looking in the places that are gonna give you a diverse uh, talent pool? Also opportunities, how are you nurturing your teams? Uh, you know, we can talk about creating processes for promotions and rewards and stretch assignments. Uh, also implement personal development plans and, and merit-based growth. 
And before we're done, we're going to give you some specific tools on a couple of these. Also, personal mindfulness, right? How can you activate your prefrontal cortex? How can you unhook your amygdala hijack? So meditation, breathing, and self-care are ways to do that. And trusting teams. How do you build trust within the team once you have diversity? So things like group norms and stand-up meetings and individual feedback and communication circles are ways to do that. So one of the ways to literally unhook your, your amygdala is by breathing. If you take slow, deep breaths, remember this is a physiological thing that's happening in our brain, you can change where the energy is going, right? So your brain is spending energy and it's going to the amygdala. And if you take slow, deep breaths, you will automatically relax and your energy will be focused on your prefrontal cortex. Really simple, works all the time. You can do the same thing with clenching your muscles. You can just tighten up any one of your muscles and your amygdala will just start to relax. Also get enough sleep. Self-care is so important. We've all experienced uh, sleep deprivation, uh, not, not feeling rested and we make poor choices. That is, uh, and same thing with being hungry. Uh, there's been lots of studies on judges who don't make great, the best decisions when they're hungry just before lunch, you know, like 11 o'clock, then afterwards. And there are things that your teams can do. So stand-up meetings. So a great, uh, a great example of a stand-up meeting is that there were surgeons in Chicago that before the surgery, and not just the surgeons, but the entire surgical team, would take a step back from the table and they'd go around the room and they'd say their name and they'd say what they were there for. That was it, just their name and what they're there for. And by doing that, the whole team got grounded and the efficacies, the outcomes of the surgeries improved dramatically. And this happened because everyone got present and conscious to what was in front of them. Any other thoughts or any other uh, expectations they may have had were all grounded in, this is what we're doing and we're all in this together. And you can do that with your teams. You can have stand-up meetings before interviews, before promotions, uh, before any type of in engagement with employees to make sure that everyone knows what's going on. And while it may seem like, oh, we don't have the time to do it, it actually works. And the more that you do these things and the things that we talked about earlier, the better that you'll get at them. And the more effortlessly, the more habit forming they'll be. Also teach your recruiters and your hiring managers how to use scorecards and experiential interviewing and how to recognize unconscious bias and its effects and how to reduce it. There are many, many ways to, to make that happen, not just what we're talking about here. So you want to increase your ability to hire the right people and not, less by, let, not, not let bias get in the way. So I'm going to pause there for a minute and uh, go to our audience and see if they have any, uh, they have any questions or comments. Um, I just, I mean, I just like the idea of uh, reminding myself to slow down, you know, with decisions and that, you know, we do have enough information. This isn't a survival thing. This is a like thoughtful, like whatever the decision is. Uh, I like that concept and idea. Does anyone have any ideas on how they would take, uh, take what we talked about back to their office? I have a question on experiential interviewing. Uh, so let, let, oh, go ahead, Darlene. No, I, I mean, I, I, I like the stand-up meeting um, and I actually was trying to think about how that works now when we're in a Zoom world, <laughs> you know, when we're virtual and, and what are some of the biases that may come out being that you're in a virtual kind of setting, right? So, um, the things that people might pay attention to in your Zoom room where you are, whether or not we should be having people have very generic backgrounds or, you know, the, the, the backgrounds that speak to their identity. All of those kinds of things are starting to pop in as to, in terms of biases that come towards people in the workplace. So that's kind of interesting. I don't have an answer for it. Um, yeah, that's a great point. I think a couple of best practices that I'm seeing, and I'm, I've been having my participants turn on their video 
um, you know, we don't go to work with a box over our head, right? When we're, when we're with our team, they can physically see us and, and have that experience. And I think that, um, that we need to have people show their physical appearance. There's so much being said in my face and in my movements that, that communicate. A lot of our communication is nonverbal, right? So the first thing I'd say to, to kind of normalize that is to make sure that everyone's communicating the same way, which would be to turn on video cameras. And you make a really good point, and I don't, you know, I think this is a good discussion to have is, you know, what would people have in their backgrounds? You know, what, what's okay? I know that um, I have friends who work from home and feel a little uncomfortable with their colleagues seeing their home. Mm -hmm. So maybe there needs to be some provision by the company to create what might be a, a safe space or a space that people feel comfortable sharing. Um, I do think that you can, you know, we can all get dressed and look appropriately for, for the work setting. Uh, but I think what you're saying adds some, some really interesting uh, nuance to, to how folks can communicate in a, in a Zoom world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, and I have a comment. Yeah, go ahead, Quentin. So um, this presentation reminds me of the importance of having um, a diverse decision-making team so that you can counter various unconscious bias. Uh, I think that's important. I think sometimes overlooked that, you, that having a team approach toward making these kinds of decisions uh, about recruiting, about any other uh, important decision. It's important to have diversity in the decision maker as well as the folks that we're looking at. Perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. Totally. I mean, in, in interviewing and in any kind of process where you have a lot of people, um, diversity of thought, right? And, and, and to, to improve that diversity, it's good to have some processes that are nonverbal, right? So where people are, are giving their feedback based on a scoring system or a checkbox. So it's blind, right? So if, if we were to interview somebody and we all agreed what a one, two, three, four, and five is a, as a response for that particular question, and we, we scored on a scorecard for that particular candidate, it would be very hard for us to bias that, right? Because one, um, there'd be too many scores for us to kind of coordinate. We wouldn't, you know, the interviewers wouldn't necessarily talk to each other, uh, you know, uh, before, right? Or, and not during, so that there's, um, uh, a more permission for people to give a more authentic score, a more authentic feedback. And it wouldn't be just that, but it's a, it's a great tool to bring in. And I think we can do that for anything. Uh, if we're making decisions, um, sometimes it might be good to have a, a blind scoring, depending on the decision. Because often speaking up, uh, particularly speaking up, right, we have people who don't feel comfortable speaking up and we don't get their information. So in meetings, I think we've all been in meetings where the people who like to talk the most their way will be the way and that doesn't work. So how do we create more ways of us to communicate? I think Zoom is kind of fascinating because you know, we now have polls and we have other ways to engage and share our wisdom to make the best decisions. That's a great point, Quentin. Did anyone else have a question? I think I saw a couple of questions here. Beza, you do stand-ups with your team. Yes, I do that every, every Monday to kind of set the week right. We kind of do a check-in and a check-out just to kind of get people centered, see where they're at. Um, they can talk about something that took place over the weekend that they want to share or some, how they're feeling in the present moment. And then we just kind of get aware of what's, what's on people's plate and then where they might need support. So if Lauren, you were on my team, I would say, hey, Lauren, I have this huge qualitative data analysis to do you know, on Wednesday, can you help me with it? So it's a, it's a place to also ask for support. And do you feel like those stand-up meetings uh, have a reduction in bias? Like people are more like they're using their prefrontal cortex instead of their amygdala? I feel like your insight now I'm processing and thinking about because I never thought about it in that way. So I'm grateful for your insight. I was more so doing it from like team connection standpoint and project management, like who has what to do and holding each other accountable. So um, I have to continue to think about this, so. Yeah, great. I mean, and I think that's the thing that we need to remember is that unconscious bias is not a personality driven thing, right? It's just a function of the brain and it's, it's um, it, it can be very simple to, to just mitigate it. 
Uh, I had a question. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Deza. I was going to also add um, facilitation is a tool that I use with a, lot, with a lot of my clients. So how you design the meeting and you can do rounds to make sure there's input from each person or create space for people to kind of reflect in a journal first and then report out. So I did want to offer faci using facilitation in a way to help include more voices in the room as well. Yeah, that's a great, a great tool. Yeah, I think opening, so for those of you who are listening to this, HR professionals, um, you know, the key takeaway should be that we need to create some language. You need to create some language at your organization around unconscious bias and start figuring out from the people who work there, what's going to work. And, um, you know, one technique that's used in, uh, in restorative justice is that you make a list of everyone's name in the meeting and everyone has to speak. Right. So there's and everyone gets like a minute or two so that you can kind of normalize who owns the room. Right. Often in a room, it'll be the person with the loudest voice, like I was saying before. But that's one way of kind of mitigating that that type of bias. And of course, there can be people can speak more, but at least you get to hear from everyone. Anyone else had any? Uh, that's a great uh, implementation. Anyone else wanted to share? Lauren, I'll share a little bit. Go ahead, Melissa. Um, one of the things that I started to do in about the past year at work is actually um, ask that, uh, so I have two teams that I run and when, when we have regular meetings and asking them to actually create the agenda items, I don't go into a meeting with a list of agenda items or put out the agenda before that. I actually open it up uh, about a week before and I ask them to go ahead and put those items on the agenda that they need to talk about um, as opposed to me running the meeting, they're running the meeting. And then also I found it helpful to rotate the facilitators as well. So I'm not the only one facilitating meeting, we are, but we do have to do that. We have to, like we go by alphabetical order, for instance, and then we rotate that as well. So then there's always a new voice that's helping run the meeting, keeping everyone on track and inviting others to provide input. But we found that when we opened up the agenda uh, to the teams that they began to then take ownership more so, as opposed to me walking in with what I wanted to talk about or what I felt was needed to be talked about. That's a great idea. And what do you notice? Uh, like, how would that mitigate um, bias in your group? I think I think it helps with bringing different perspectives uh, to the table. I think it also opens up others to listening and hearing from others as well, as opposed to um, me being like the leader or the manager of the teams. At me being the only one making, uh, you know, <laughs> decisions or um, so it's, it's helpful because I think it also it opens up communication and it fosters uh, connectivity as well between all of them. Awesome. Cool. Well, I think we're, we're kind of running out of time. Uh, we only had a half hour. So um, any, any last comment? Okay, so um, so we're going to wrap up. And uh, I want to thank everyone in my audience for being here. Uh, thank you so much. And for those of you who are watching, um, thanks so much for, for uh, being here. I'm just going to finish up with the last couple of, a couple of slides so that we get nailed down a few more things. So we know about the team actions to reduce bias. Um, also, you know, what's next? So if you're watching this, what's next for you, right? You, we have a, a variety of workshops uh, that we offer which I'm sure uh, you'll have access to through HRCI. And, uh, and my final tip. So first impressions, question them. Often they are the ones that trigger a, uh, a bias response from your past. And the more we talk about and accept our own biases, the more we move this from the unconscious to the conscious. And we can absolutely uh, mitigate any of the stigma and have great conversations. So, Thank you so much. I want to thank my uh, thank my audience once again, and you have a good rest of the day. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Thanks, Great Lauren. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks, Lauren. I always learn something new, so thank you. Well done. Lauren, we're, we're